Okay, so we'll start with the homage to the Buddha three times. <coughs> Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samasambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samasambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato Okay, good morning everybody. And today is July 11th, 2015. And so we're resuming after a long interval. And today we'll be taking a group of suttas in the Majjhimini Kaya, which are united by a similar title and a similar topic. So the general title that governs this group of suttas is the Paddeka Rata Sutta. And so this is sutta number 131, which is on page 1039. And then there are three other suttas which have basically the same title, the same subject, and they're distinguished only by the name of a particular monk who is either the speaker of the sutta or in some way figures in the, in the sutta. Okay, the title itself is already a bit problematic. So there have been different, actually different translations of this title. In the first edition of the Middle Length Discourses, where I just let Venerable Jnana Moli's translation stand. So Venerable Jnana Moli translated it, One Fortunate Attachment. But on reflection, I came to consider that that was a wrong translation. Okay, the title, or the word, Okay, so we have the word Buddha in Pali, which can mean good or excellent, fortunate is a little bit of a stretch since it doesn't imply fortune, but just being good or excellent. Then there is the word Eka which means one. And then the word rata, this is where the differences in interpretation arise. Okay, how Nyanamoli got one fortunate attachment? You see, the word rata could be the past participle of the verb rajati, which also gives us the noun raga. So rajati means to be attached, but usually in the sense of being full of passion for something, or being full of lust for something. And so raga, the noun, comes to mean passion, lust, or attachment in that strong sense. And so it seems that Nyanamoli took rata to be 
a noun based on this past participle, meaning attachment. And so we took it to be somebody who has one attachment, and that attachment is good. So he had one fortunate attachment. Okay, another monk in Sri Lanka, his name is Bhikkhu Nyanananda. He interpreted Badega Rata, he used the translation, <laughs> Ideal Solitude. I think that was the general title, but he used the idea of one who is devoted to ideal solitude. Since, okay, he took Bhada again as good or excellent, Eka as one, but he extended it in the meaning to give the sense of solitude, and Rata as being attached to in the sense of devoted to. So one who is devoted to good or excellent solitude. Again, this is, I would say, it's a stretch of the original meaning. And I think it fits Venerable Nyanananda's personality very well, because he's always been very devoted to living as a monk in solitude. But the word rata can also be taken as related to, there's a more common word for a knight, which is rati in Sanskrit, ratri. But in Sanskrit you could also have ratra, meaning night. And so if we turn this into Pali, then we would also get rata. And so this is where we get a single night, which is good, or what do we have here? A single excellent night. Okay, one way we might think to resolve this ambiguity in the title is to look, for example, at the Chinese translation, hoping we could get some light there. <laughs> But the Chinese have sort of escaped the problem <laughs> by transliterating the word. So they have, I copied it down, Badi, Badi Loti, <laughs> or another edition has Bado Loti, which are just attempts to put Badeka to use Chinese characters that will give those sounds, so it's transliterated. But there is a Tibetan translation which has the Sanskrit title, and I think that there might have been some fragments also recovered from the Central Asia of the Sanskrit edition, or Sanskrit manuscript, and that has Patrika Ratri. Yes, this is correct. Yes, so the way it came when it was transposed into Sanskrit, Bhadra just becomes Bhadraka. Basically, they're just two forms of the same word. And Ratri clearly means night. So in the Sanskrit version, it comes out an excellent night a good night. Whereas in Pali it's a little more specific by keeping the, using the word eka, which means one. And I think this is supported by the text of the verses, as we'll see, rather than one fortunate attachment or one who is devoted to ideal solitude.
Okay, now we can turn to the text of the sutta itself. Okay, and so this sutta takes place when the Buddha is living in Savati at Chaita's Grove. And then he addresses the monks and he says, I shall teach you the summary and exposition of here it's one who has had a single excellent night. <clears throat> okay, so there are two aspects that the Buddha announces in the opening to the sutta. You can see that he speaks of a summary and an exposition. And this is a common way in which the Buddha presents his teaching. In fact, a number of the suttas that occur in this particular chapter of the Majjhima Nikaya are developed out of these two ideas. One is called in Pali, Udena. Okay, the, the word that's translated synopsis in Pali is udesa. So this is the brief presentation of the teaching. So often the Buddha will just give a very short, very concise statement. And sometimes the Buddha will just give the short statement, the udesa, then he gets up and leaves. <laughs> and then the monks are perplexed, what is the meaning of that? And then they start discussing amongst themselves who can explain this to us. And it seems that the Buddha has gone into his cottage and shut the door. <laughs> and so then they go to one of the other monks. Usually it's either Mahakachana or uh, Ananda. Okay, the counterpart to the Udesa is what is called the Vibhanga. The Vibhanga would be the analysis of the principles that are contained in the short statement or summary, the analysis or exposition. And so in the suttas, the word Vibhanga is used, which comes from the verb Bhanjati, which means to break. <coughs> so Vibhanga is, you could say, it's the breakdown or analysis of the teaching. But it seems that the proper, really proper counterpart of the Udesa, of Udesa, should be Nidesa, which comes to be used in the commentaries to mean the, like the exposition or the elaboration. So the concise teaching is the Udesa. Sometimes this is also called Earth. I don't want to overload people who are not studying Pali with Pali words, but the Buddha sometimes gives the teaching, explains Sankitena, that is, in brief or concisely, and then either the Buddha himself or somebody else will give. Vitarena, that means he will explain in detail. So, 
Sankirtana, the brief teaching, is the Udesa, the concise statement, and Vitarena, the teaching given, the elaborate teaching, is the Vibhanga, the analysis, or the exposition. Okay, so now the Buddha is announcing to the monks that he's going to give both the brief teaching or the summary and the exposition of one who has had a single excellent night. Okay, then he begins to speak and Venerable Nyanamoli, this is Venerable Nyanamoli's translation, he's translated it somewhat um, poetically (laughs) or a bit eloquently, not so literally. So he says, let not a person revive the past. I think literally the word, the expression used would be, let not a person go back, run back to the past. Or on the future, build his hopes. Yeah, I have actually in the notes a more literal rendering. Let not a person run back to the past or live in exposition, in expectation of the future. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Okay, so these are the kinds of advice to be given. In fact, you'll see that the whole poem is about kind of advice given for somebody who is developing insight or vipassana. Okay, so the future, uh, the past has been left behind. The future has not been reached. Then I think the key to the verse, the next two lines are the key to the verse. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state. So in Pali, it's pachu panang yo dhammang tata tata vipassati. So tata tata vipachu panang dhammang. That means the presently arisen dharma or phenomena. And then tata tata vipassati He sees it in this way and in that way. Or he sees it on this occasion, on that occasion. So as each presently arisen state arises, one contemplates it with insight. And according to the the Chinese translation of this, or the Chinese counterpart, the parallel, It says that he sees it with insight, each presently arisen state as being unstable, which, or unlasting, which implies the characteristic of impermanence. So he's seeing it as impermanent. And then the commentary to the sutta says that he sees each presently arisen state, this is the Pali commentary, by way of what are called the seven contemplations, the seven contemplations of insight. That is, one sees it as impermanent, as dukkha or bound up with suffering, as anatta, non-self, and then one sees it nibida, nibida, nibida anupasana, contemplating it in a way that leads to disenchantment, Virag anupasana, one sees it in a way that leads to dispassion. Nirod anupasana, one sees its cessation. And pati nisag anupasana, one sees, sees it while relinquishing attachments to it. Okay, so those are, that's a kind of commentarial elaboration, but the Buddha just uses the expression, one sees it as it arises in the present with insight. One sees it clearly.
And then he uses the words to indicate how one maintains the mind when one is seeing it. He says, invincibly, unshakably, a sang hi rung, a san kupang. Okay, so this would indicate that one remains steady and strong and clear in the insight so that one cannot be shaken by distraction, by disturbance, but the mind is continuously focused, one-pointedly, on the present moment, observing whatever is arising, and then as it perishes, one takes the next phenomena that arises. So in a way, you could say that that line, invincibly, unshakably, Maybe we should put like a division of stanzas here and say that that marks the end of the first part of the poem. And then the second part that comes now is a kind of urge or incitement to develop a sense of urgency to undertake this practice now, not postponing to the future. <laughs> so he says, Today the effort must be made, tomorrow death may come, who knows? So death can come at any time, we have no foreknowledge when death will strike, so the effort must be made today. Again, this emphasis on today, that to my mind reinforces the interpretation of the suit of the topic of the sutta as being an excellent night. Because in Pali, actually, the word rata or rati, night, covers, can cover a 24-hour cycle. So it's not just the nighttime as opposed to the daytime, but we say, you know, we use the expression this day to refer to a 24-hour cycle. But in the Indian languages, North Indian languages, the word that covers the 24-hour cycle can, or the word rati, night, can cover the 24-hour cycle. Okay, so today the effort must be made, tomorrow death may come, who knows? No bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. So this is now, for mortality, the text uses the word macho, not the English word macho, <laughs> meaning somebody with a hyper-masculine type, but macho. So macho also means death. But sometimes it takes on, we call it a more personalized representation of death. So as the word marana, the usual word for death, just signifies the event of dying. But machu sometimes becomes depicted almost like the overlord of death, the lord of death. And it becomes almost synonymous with mara. And so we have in numbers of verse texts, Machu Raja, the king of death. And so the personalized depiction is indicated here by keeping him and his hordes or his army away. I remember when I got the first proofs of this back could be 1993, something like that, when Wisdom Publications was typesetting it and I was in Sri Lanka, they sent me the proofs. <laughs> and somehow the typist, the person who was typing, had typed in here, a bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. <laughs> and I thought, 
wow, this is really the subtle work of Mara taking over the mind of the typist. <laughs> and I have been reading, you know, all of the other typesetting has been just so accurate that I was becoming a little bit lackadaisical in reading the proof. And I almost skipped over that. <laughs> And suddenly, just something registered with me. Something's wrong there. <laughs> then I looked again, and a bargain with mortality. That's exactly what it's not saying. <laughs> okay, so no bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away, but one who dwells thus ardently that is, who is ardently devoted to this unshakable, invincible insight contemplation of the present moment, relentlessly, by day, by night. And here, by day, by night, we have what was called in Pali a compound. What kind of compound is it? No, it's not about the Bihu. Okay, Ahu, Aho is day, and Rata is night. So it's a dual compound used adverbally. It's an adverb. Dyadic compound, Vanda compound but it's used that verbally. So here, because we have the word rata here, meaning night, this reinforces again my conviction that in the original title, night is intended, not devotion to or um, attachment to. So then, the verse ends, it is he, the peaceful sage, this is Santo Muni, it's an epithet for the Buddha. The peaceful sage has said, who has, it uses Badekaratang. So this is what I, has been translated here, one who has had a single excellent night. And so I would take the expression Badeka Rata, which is interestingly and a bit perplexingly, the expression itself is not analyzed anywhere in the text, and it occurs only in this group of suttas, not elsewhere in the canon. So searching throughout the rest of the canon to try to find an explanation it's futile. I know that because now with the electronic search programs we can search the whole canon and the expression will only turn up here. Okay, so this is the what the Buddha calls the summary or it's the brief statement, the synopsis of Padeka Rata. But now the Buddha is going on his own initiative he's going to give. Maybe at this point I'll ask whether there's any questions on this and anything that's been covered so far. Apart from, you know, the questions of the meaning of these lines, which is going to be explained in the, in the exposition or analysis. Richard. Yeah, uh, you're saying that, you know, the, no more than I'm saying that the word machu is sometimes used, particularly in the form machu raja, the king of mortality, is used as a designation for Mara. So I'm wondering is, there, is how is this related, say, to the Christian idea that one that that 
Mephisto will want one to bargain with him. Is this similar to that? I mean, that is, because Mephisto is sort of a Christian notion that corresponds to Mara. Yeah. But I haven't heard about, you know, I don't, I don't know any bargaining with mortality or a king of mortality in mm. Western, you know, yeah. in, the, in the Western idioms. Yeah. But is there is there some connection between this and the idea of bargaining with the devil? Is it similar? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I think the idea of bargaining with the devil is that he does some favor for you and you commit your soul to the devil in order to get some worldly favor. Yeah. Like the devil says that he'll arrange things so that you become a great success in business or yeah. a famous sports yeah. star. But yeah. when you die, then your soul goes to the devil. This is right. just, it's very unique or, or very seldom in the Buddhist literature that one finds an expression like this. And I think this occurs here only because it's a verse, so it's using more well, metaphorical and personified ideas. Well, the, the content of this bargain is simply the postponement of death. Is that right? There's, a, there's not another bargain going on with mortality. Yeah, it's not elaborated in any way, okay. just the expression is used. Okay. And Barbara? First, to me, the Western equivalent is the Grim, Grim Reaper. And we talk about staying ahead of the Grim, Grim Reaper, Reaper and not letting him catch up. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not so familiar with that. I mean, I know the expression Grim Reaper. It's supposed to be death who reaps everything. Mm -hmm. But making a bargain with the Grim Reaper, that I don't know. No, I think we tend to talk about staying ahead of him staying out of his way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Chris, Barbara, was that your name? Sorry? Chris, was that yeah, your name? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, it says that insight and deceit each presently arisen state. So the word state here, instead of dhamma? It's the word dhamma, yeah. And uh, so why is it rendered as state instead of like phenomenon? <laughs> I mean, this is the problem in rendering the word Dhamma used in that sense of an entity, a concrete thing. One could, it's a matter of personal choice. Um, I actually prefer, I mean, sometimes I use phenomena. I believe it was, I think it was Nyanamoli who used state here. No, in verses, in, I think also Nyana Moli was trying to work with the meter and phenomena doesn't fit so well into the meter. Okay, I think we'll continue. Okay, so now the Buddha is going to give the analysis or the exposition. And so he starts off with how a person does not revive the past, or how he does not run back to the past. Okay, so he says, how does one not, how does one, re, first, how does one revive the past? Then he says, one nurtures delight there, thinking, I had such material form in the past. And similarly with each of the other aggregates. So in other words, one calls each of the aggregates to mind, or usually, I mean, an ordinary person doesn't think in terms of the aggregates, but rather he'll be thinking simply in terms of past experience. I had such an experience in the past. But from the Buddhist perspective, the way one <coughs> analyzes that experience, that experience will be an experience in terms of either one or another of the five aggregates. So one had such, maybe thinking in the past, I had <laughs> such a body, that would be the case of form. I used to be youthful and healthy, 
handsome, well, I'm still handsome, <laughs> and I had full head of hair. Now, even if I let my hair grow, it wouldn't be very full. <laughs> and clear, bright skin. So one thinks of all of those things, of one's own body or other forms, bodies that one experienced in the past or physical objects experience, or one thinks of one's past feelings or perceptions, things one saw, heard, um, sensed in other ways, one's volitional activities, what ideas one had, what plans, one's projects, what undertakings one made, and one's consciousness, what one was aware of in the past, or the state, you could say maybe the functioning of one's mind in the past. And one thinks about all of these, bringing, the, the text uses the expression, nurturing delight, or bringing delight to bear upon them. Okay, then the case of not reviving the past is that one doesn't nurture delight about them, thinking I had such form in the past, such feeling, perception, volitional activities, consciousness in the past. Now this raises a question, and I'm not quite sure how to resolve this question, or even, you know, exactly, the Pali itself is a little ambiguous in that it could be taken to mean that one thinks about the past without bringing delight upon it, or one does not think of the past at all with thoughts of delight. You know, do you see the difference here? One is that one could think about the past, but one shouldn't bring delight to bear upon those thoughts of the past. And the other is that one shouldn't delight in thinking about the past. But how does one contemplate? I mean, you just went through a class. It's the past. You contemplate what's happened, but there's no delight in it. I mean, if you just contemplate, I mean, without... Okay, I want to try give my explanation of the two ways to understand this. Well, first I would say there's two ways to understand this. This is my sort of interpretation. And I think I developed this in contrast to, do you know of J. Krishnamurti? He was a famous sort of Indian, though he was resident in the United States in California, but originally from India, a kind of radical philosophical thinker, a, in a way a spiritual teacher, though he's would always say, I don't take any personal disciples. But he would always say that the problem of the human mind, the problem of human existence is memory, thinking about the past. And so he seemed to be saying that to become spiritually free, one has to obliterate mem <laughs> memory. <laughs> but it would make me wonder that you know, if he's made a plan for like a, a speaking tour, <laughs> you know, I have engagements to go to. When I was in graduate school, he came to our graduate school to give a, a series of talks. I mean, <laughs> he had to have like a plan, like, okay, on such and such a day, I'll be going to Claremont and <laughs> giving talks there. <laughs> so you have to remember things. Okay, so the way I would understand this is that, okay, in general, sort of a general advice is that in one's day-to-day -day activities, one can't avoid thinking of the past. And even the Buddha gives discourses when he says, in the past, Pu Bei, when I was a bodhisattva, not yet enlightened, the thought occurred to me, no household life is bondage, the life gone forth is free, let me cut off my hair and beard and go forth. 
So he has recollections and then he tells about going to Alara Kalama and Ramaka, uh, Alara Kalama Udaka Ramaputta, what he, the conversations he had with them, the experiences he had with them. So he has memories, even the Buddha has memories. So the problem is not memory per se, but it's going back and thinking sort of longingly what one experienced in the past and trying to recapture that. And this happens even with people, not to speak about sensual pleasures, but even people have this with meditation, meditative experiences. Ah, uh, last week when I was meditating, I had such a peaceful state or my mind was so blissful and now my mind is just overrun by distracting thoughts, even though I'm practicing so diligently. Ah, uh, if I could only recapture that experience that I had in the past. So in a way that's also running back into the past. Okay, so one way to understand this is that one could think about the past, in fact one has to think about the past when necessary, but not with these thoughts of longing and this nostalgia to try to recapture the past and this indulgence in memories of the past. So that is, say, the general advice. But then the specific advice, now the Buddha is speaking about somebody who is a diligent meditator. In that case, one shouldn't even be thinking about, at least when one is actively engaged in the practice, one shouldn't even be thinking about meaningful things in the past but keeping the mind focused, tata tata vipassati, vipachupanang yang dhammang tata tata vipassati, that one contemplates with insight that presently arisen phenomena. So even if thoughts, memories of the past come up, then one treats them just as presently arisen phenomena and sees them as impermanent. Okay, so this is dealing with the past. Then we come to bit what's tr a little freely translated here as building up hope upon the future, more literally having expectations for the future. So the Buddha says, how does one build up hope upon the future? Then he says, one nurtures the light there thinking May I have such material form in the future? May I have such feelings, such perceptions, such volitional activities, such consciousness in the future? That's how one builds up hope upon the future. How does one <clears throat> not... How does one not build up hope upon the future? <clears throat> one does not nurture delight there thinking, may I have such material form in the future, such feeling in the future, such perception in the future, such formation, volitional activities in the future, such consciousness in the future. So again, I think this twofold distinction applies to the future in one's ordinary day-to-day -day life, of course it's necessary to have thoughts about the future. Like, <laughs> you know, in fact, nowadays we have too many thoughts about the future. You know, like we have the Zhuangyan calendar, it's prepared 2000, for 2015, it's prepared towards the end of 2014. And now getting the calendar prepared in October, it's too late. Now it seems you have to start getting the calendar prepared in July for the next year and filling in all of the dates. So you have to start thinking about the future. When will we have the Chinese New Year celebration? When will we have what, the fall ritual for the deceased? When will we have the Buddha's birthday celebration? <laughs> so you don't even know what the lunar calendar looks like, but you have to start filling in the calendar. And then if somebody is like a popular Dhamma teacher, you know, <laughs> try to, <laughs> to, 
to get them for a talk for 2016? No, it's all their calendar's already filled in. You have to start thinking 217, 218. <laughs> and they're going to get up there and say, keep your mind on the present. <laughs> Don't let the mind wander to the past and the future. Of course, it's easy because they have it all recorded on machines like this, so they don't have to think about it. Okay, but if we make the twofold distinction, so ordinarily, you know, we have to make plans for the future, and so we have to think about the future. And but the ideal way that the Buddha advises is without having great expectations for the future building up great hopes for the future. Because when we build up great hopes and expectations, things often work out differently from what we expected. And then we, when things don't work out as expected, then there comes disappointment, disillusionment. Okay, so this is the advice sort of in what we call day-to-day -day life make plans for the future, but without investing great hopes and expectations in them. But again, for the meditator who's practicing insight, then the advice is to keep the mind focused on pachu panang dhammang, the presently arisen state phenomena, factor of experience. So even thoughts about the future arise, again, we treat, one treats them just as a presently arisen phenomena. It, the thoughts arise, they'll be present for some time, they'll pass away. Okay, so this is the past and the future. And then we come to the presently arisen states. And so the Buddha then raises the question, how is one va <clears throat> vanquished in regard to presently arisen states? And the verb here that's rendered vanquished, the verb is sanghiriti, which connects this line with the line in the verse but we have invincibly, unshakably. So the word that's translated invincibly is asanghirang, not being vanquished. So that ties with this verb. And then the Buddha explains how one is vanquished in regard to the present, presently arisen dhammas, by way of what is called sakaya ditti. So this is the view of the person as being or possessing a truly existent self. So Sakaya is from Sat, which means existent. Kaya means body, but here in a broad sense, not just the physical body, but it refers to the collection of, or the composite of the five aggregates. And so, as we could see from the explanation that's given here, Sakaya Ditti is the view either of the aggregates as a self or of a self that exists in some relation to the five aggregates. And so we have the exposition that the untaught ordinary person, this is the deluded worldling who is not acquainted with the teaching, the Dhamma of the noble ones, regards material form as self, that's direct identification 
or the self as the owner of material form. The self is somehow a non-material entity that possesses the body material form. Or the self as or material form is existing within the self. The self as a kind of container in which material form is existing or the self is existing in material form. Then the same four possibilities are applied to the other aggregates, feeling, perception, the volitional activities, consciousness. So we've gone through the Sakaya Titi several times in the past in detail, so we don't have to go into it, elaborate on it here. But the point that's being conveyed here is that the ordinary person, the unenlightened person, by identifying the five aggregates as the self, or in some way the possessions of the self, is being vanquished or conquered by presently arisen fit states. And then the one who is invincible in regard to presently arisen states, this is the noble disciple who does not regard any of the five aggregates as a self or as the possessions of a self. Okay, so then at the end, the Buddha repeats the entire synopsis or verse, set of verses, and then he says that it was with reference to this that it was said that I shall teach you the summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night. Okay, maybe I should ask at this point whether there are any questions. Okay. Mante, just that one, uh, just the one little verse there, or self as in consciousness, or consciousness as in self. Can you expound on that a little bit? I, I know you have in the past, but it just doesn't make sense right now. I just... What I, what I would, you know, I, I don't actually know how to elaborate all of these in detail, but what I, as a conjecture or a hypothesis, what I would say is that if somebody regards the body as the self, form as the self, then they can hold that consciousness ex exists within the body. And so consciousness exists in the body, which is the self. So self equals the body, and consciousness exists within the body, therefore within the self. How to take self as existing in consciousness? I don't know, anybody have any ideas about that? I think therefore I am. Excuse me? I think therefore I am. Does it have anything to do with uh, everything is mind? Maybe, I'm not sure. Generally, the Buddha's positions would be sort of aim, well, there are a large number of sort of speculations about the self that were going on during the Buddha's time. Sometimes you could see that the Buddha's position is somewhat <coughs> aimed at the theory of self emerging from the, in the Upanishads. Yeah, Richard. Yeah, well, uh, David Hume is, is taking the position that the consciousness that self is not the content of consciousness. That when he says, look, I, I look for everything that's in my consciousness, I find there are these vivid things by which you sense perceptions, and then there are these vague things which are ideas. 
but I don't find any self. Yeah. But as he's taking the same position that the Buddha is taking yeah. regarding self as a content of consciousness. Mm. Yeah, but that is somewhat different from the position which falls into Sakaya Titi, which takes the self to be in consciousness. The one who says the self exists in consciousness is not saying that the self is just a concept or idea which is constructed by conscious activity, but they're affirming a real self, yeah. but that self exists in consciousness in some way. Right, and that's, that's what that I'm saying. That's what Hume is denying. Oh, I see, I see. You see, that he's taking the same position as Hume. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. saying, yeah, these people think that there is a that there is a solid existence yeah. of a thing yeah. of some kind yeah. Yeah. that they call a self. He says, yeah. I don't see one. Yeah. I don't have one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one would have to be, I guess, more thoroughly acquainted with all of the ideas that were, you know, sort of floating around during the Buddha's time. Yeah, I haven't really specifically looked into that. Yeah. Um, I, that book I gave you actually something uh, yeah. Damajiva expounded on it a little. I was hoping I was hoping you would be able to. Oh, I didn't get. To, I mean, you yeah. gave it to me last evening, yeah. so I didn't get a chance to look at it. Any other questions? I I think when you say self, you denote the body, the name, yeah. and the form. Yeah. And form denotes consciousness and no. it is derived from the past as change from the present actions mm. as would change from the present actions to mm. what would happen in the future mm. which would be only overcome by greed and by following the eight noble paths mm. or the chakra vihata, the four noble truths mm. so it's a continuation chariot Mm. which would be only overcome, mm. you know, the, the present is a continuation of the past, the yeah. future is a yeah. continuation yeah. of the present, yeah. but when you overcome greed, yeah. and you overcome the need to live, yeah. e mostly as denoted by worldly possessions, yeah. then you attain enlightenment, yeah. and the way the Buddhists, especially the Theravada mm. sect, denotes yeah. as you overcome and get the enlightenment, is by, mm. not by overcoming greed in the negative sense, but by attaining enlightenment in mm. studying mm. the reasons for cause and death. Mm -hmm. Because if you really analyze it, mm. the purpose of living for the human beings is cause and death to get yeah. early positions, yeah. which is denoted by greed, selflessness, yeah. and foolishness. Yeah. So if we eradicate the need for that by conquering the mind, either by the four noble paths or the eight uh, noble ways or the middle path, then slowly, slowly through different, different existence as we mm -hmm. hope that mm -hmm. there is a karmic force which gives rebirth, you get yeah. rid of ignorance, yeah. you attain, yeah. you, you give up greed, uh, yeah. Or you attain enlightenment. Yeah. And there is no need to live again. <coughs> okay, so I think we should go on now. Because I wanted to cover the four Padeka Rata Suttas. But the second one, there's not anything that's really additional to it. It's just that the Buddha overhears Ananda explaining the Sutta and he praises Ananda for teaching that Sutta. The one that's somewhat interesting and gives a different, slightly different perspective on the verses is Sutta number 133. This is called the Mahakachana Padekarata Sutta, which is translated here just Mahakachana and the single excellent night. Okay, this sutta begins when it's a time when the Buddha has been living at Rajgir and he's at the park, called the Park of the Hot Springs. It was a park near outside of Rajgir in which there was a hot spring. And so the monks would go there for bathing. And so one day when it was, the dawn was coming on, a monk named Samiddhi 
went to the hot springs to bathe. And so after he's bathed, he comes out and he's standing wearing just one robe, drying his body. <clears throat> and then it said that a certain deity of beautiful appearance came and he approached the Venerable Samiddhi. And then standing to one side, the deity said to him, Do you remember the summary and exposition of one who has had an excellent, a single excellent night? And Samiddhi says, I do not remember the summary and exposition. And he says, do you remember the summary and exposition? And the deity says, I too do not remember the summary and exposition of one who has had an excellent, a single excellent night. Then the deity says, do you remember the stanzas of one who has had a single excellent night? And Samiddhi says, I do not remember the stanzas who has had a single excellent night, but do you remember the stanzas? And then the deity says, I too do not remember the stanzas. But then the deity says to him, but learn the summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night. Master the summary and exposition. Remember the summary and exposition. The summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night is beneficial. It belongs to the fundamentals of the holy life. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So this is what the deity says, and then the deity vanishes. Okay, so then a little bit later, after the night is completely vanished, the monk Samiddhi goes to the Buddha, pays homage to him, and he says, he makes a request to the Buddha, he says, it would be good, Bhante, if the Blessed One would teach me the summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night. Okay, so the Buddha agrees to this and says, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. And then the Buddha starts to speak and he simply states the verses or the stanzas, the Badeka Ratta stanzas. And then having said this, I'm a, I've skipped over the stanzas, having said this, the sublime one, another term for the Buddha, rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. Is there anything that seems strange in this whole introductory passage? I see two things that are strange. Peculiar. That, that no one seems to remember? Yeah. Well, the only ones who don't remember are the deity and Samiddhi. Anything else? Seems strange. Okay, so I'll tell you what's, what is strange. Two things. First, is that the deity asks Samiddhi whether he remembers the summary and exposition of Padeka Ratta. And then he asks him, when Samiddhi answers in the negative, then he asks him, do you remember the stanzas, the Padeka Ratta stanzas? So it seems like there's two things here, the summary and exposition and the stanzas but then, when we see that the monk comes to the Buddha and asks about, for the summary and exposition, the Buddha recites the stanzas. So this implies that the stanzas, stanzas, are the summary. And so there seems to be an unnecessary duplication in that passage where the deity is conversing with the monk Samiddhi. In fact, 
my friend, the former student, Bhikkhu Analeo. He's done a, a study, he has a short paper on this sutta in his essays on the Madhyamaka Agama, his studies on the Madhyamaka Amaka. And he found in the Chinese version of the sutta, the deity asks only about the stanzas. The conversation is only about the stanzas. And this seems to make sense because when the Buddha is giving, responding to the request for the summary and exposition, the Buddha recites the stanzas. So it means that the stanzas are the summary. And then there's something else, a second thing, which is strange here. If we take the sutta the way it stands, Okay. Excuse me? Oh, exactly, exactly. Now, if we take the sutta the way it stands, the monk asks the Buddha, please teach the summary and the exposition. The Buddha says, I will. Listen carefully. Then the Buddha recites the stanzas, which are the summary. Then he gets up and leaves. So it's like the Buddha broke his promise, didn't fulfill his word, left, did only a half, half the job, and left with it incomplete. But if we take the Chinese version, then it makes sense. The monk, the conversation is about the stanzas. The monk comes to the Buddha and says, please teach me the stanzas, the verses on Bodega Ratta. Then the Buddha recites the stanzas, and then he leaves. That makes sense, because the Buddha then has completed the job. So it seems the way what Venerable Analio sort of conjectures as an explanation, that a number of other suttas in this particular chapter are framed on the idea of the Buddha reciting a summary and then giving an exposition. And so when this sutta was being transmitted through oral transmission, somehow the idea of the summary and exposition got inserted in through maybe a careless process of transmission. So if we take out the conversation about the summary and exposition and just put it in terms of the stanzas, then it makes perfect sense. The deity says, do you know the stanzas? But they can read the stanzas. The monk says, no, I don't know them. Do you know them? The deity says, no, I don't remember them. Then the monk comes to the Buddha and says, Bhante, teach me the Bhadeka Ratta stanzas. The Buddha recites the stanzas, then leaves. Okay, but in either case, okay, apparently there are, when the Buddha is reciting the stanzas, there are other monks around, not just Samiddhi, because soon after, the text says, soon after the Blessed One had gone, the monks considered okay, that the Buddha has gotten up from his seat after giving the summary without expounding the detailed meaning. And then they consider who can teach the detailed meaning, who could give the exposition. And finally, after some discussion, they <clears throat> decide on Mahakachana. The monk Mahakachana was praised by the Buddha, or he was actually appointed by the Buddha to the position of the disciple who excelled in elaborating upon short statements by the Buddha. So his special skill was to take, pick up a short statement from the Buddha and then to give a detailed analysis of it. So we see this in Sutta number 18 in the Majjhima This is the Madhupindika Sutta, the discourse on the honey, honey ball. I think that there are some suttas in, yeah, there are several suttas in the Sangyutta Nikaya in which Mahakachana elaborates on brief sayings of the Buddha. And this is another example. Okay, so the monks go to Mahakachana and ask him to <laughs> elaborate on the sutta. Then Mahakachana says, kind of modesty, he says, it's 
just like a man who was searching for heartwood, you know, for solid wood to build, like a table or a chair, and he would pass by heartwood and he would just cut off, he would search in the branches and leaves of the tree thinking he could find heartwood there. And so in the same way, he says, that when the Buddha was around, you didn't ask him for an elaboration, but you let the Buddha get up and go into his cottage, and now you're coming to me. Like, I'm just like the branches and leaves of the tree. The Buddha was like the heartwood. But then the monks protest and say that you have been praised by the Buddha. Everybody knows that you excel in giving detailed expositions. So please explain. So Mahakachana agrees and then he brings up the topic. He, well, he recites the stanzas again and then he gives his own analysis. And now he explains a bit differently from the way the Buddha has explained. So he says, how, friends, does one revive the past? Then he says, one's consciousness becomes bound up with desire and lust there, thinking, my I was thus in such a way in the past, and forms were thus. Because one's consciousness is bound up with desire and lust, one delights in that. And when one delights in that, that is in these thoughts about the past, then one revives the past. It's somewhat interesting that this text uses here the word consciousness, which is vijnana. Normally in contexts like this one would see the word citta being used. Citta is the mind, but actually citta and vijnana are just basically two terms for the same thing. Okay, so one sees that Mahakachana is explaining a little differently than the Buddha. And not only is he using different terminology, but he's explaining or expounding in terms of a different framework, which becomes clearer if we take the next paragraph. So one's consciousness becomes bound up with desire and lust there, thinking, my ear was thus and sounds with us, my nose and odors, tongue and flavors, body and tangible objects, my mind and mind objects were thus in the past. And then one's consciousness is bound up with desire and lust, one delights in that. So that is how one revives the past. Okay, so we see here that the Buddha is explaining the teaching in terms of not the five aggregates, but what scheme is being used? What framework? Right, the six sense faculties, or the six internal sense bases, and the six external sense bases. And so we can take, you know, either the five aggregates or the six sense bases. Okay, so one doesn't revive the past. Okay, one's consciousness, how does one not revive the past? One consciousness does not ba become bound up with desire and lust there, thinking, my eye was thus in the past and forms with us. Same with airs and sound, nose and odors, tongue and flavors, and so on. Then how does one build up hope upon the future? Okay, one sets one's heart on obtaining one has what one has not yet obtained, thinking, may my eye be thus in the future and forms be thus. And so one sets one's heart thus, and thereby one delights in the future. 
And so when, the, when, one build, when one delights in that, then one builds up hope upon the future. If I remember, the Chinese version says that one sets one's heart on obtaining one, what one has not yet obtained and on preserving or increasing what has already been obtained. Okay, this is applied to all the six senses. Then how does one not build up hope upon the future? Okay, one does not set one's heart on obtaining what one has not yet obtained, thinking may my, my eye be thus in the future. The same with the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Okay, then one comes to how is one vanquished in regard to presently arisen dhammas, states, or phenomena. Okay, in regard to the eye and forms that are presently arisen, one's consciousness is bound up with desire and lust for that which is presently arisen. And because one's consciousness is bound up with desire and lust, one delights in that. And when one delights in that, one is vanquished in regard to presently arisen states. And the same with regard to all of the other sense faculties. Then how is one in, now I'm at paragraph 18, how is one invincible in regard to presently arisen dhammas? Okay, in regard to the eye and forms that are presently arisen, one's consciousness is not bound up with desire and lust for that. Because the consciousness is not bound up with desire and lust, one does not take delight in that. And when one does not take delight in that, one is invincible in regard to presently arisen states. Okay, then the same is repeated in regard to the other sense faculties. Okay, and then Mahakachana says, so when the Blessed One stated these verses and then left without giving the detailed meaning, I understand the detailed meaning of this summary to be thus. And then he says to the monks, if you wish, you can go to the Blessed One and ask him about this. And as he explains it to you, so you should remember it. Okay, so the monks now bear in mind Mahakachana's words. They go to the Buddha and then they repeat Mahakachana's explanation. And they say that the Venerable Mahakachana expounded the meaning with these terms, statements, and phrases. Just in this sentence, there are two important ideas here that are really key to understanding the Dharma. There is the word atta, which is the meaning, and then there's the word padda, which is translated terms. Padda and vyanjana, terms and expressions. So we have the meaning, which is the, you say, the essence, the core, the substance of the Buddha's teaching. And then there are the words, phrases, terms that are used to expound it. And now, you see, the Buddha replies, he says, Mahakachana is wise, he has great wisdom. If you had asked me the meaning of this, I would have explained it to you in the same way that Mahakachana has explained it. Such is its meaning, and so you should remember it. <laughs> okay, so the Buddha says this. When the Buddha explained the verses, he explained it differently. He explained it in terms of the five aggregates. Mahakachana in terms of the six sense faculties. So if you grasp the terms, the phrases, the expressions, you say you would say, Ah, the Buddha and Mahakachana have different explanations. Their explanations are at least contrary to each other, if not contradictory. But if you know the distinction of atta and vyanjana, meaning and phrasing, 
then you say that the meaning is the same, the substance is the same, but they just use different expressions for a different framework for homing in on that same meaning. It yeah. starts out, it says, let not a person revive the past, and then it ends with, so you should remember. <laughs> <laughs> You have to revive the... In fact, I mean, this is... I mean, this illustrates the point that I was trying to make earlier, that if you take the attitude, I'm not going to remember anything in the past, I mean, you can't function. <laughs> I mean, if you're traveling to the subway, of course, then you won't even remember that you have a metro card in your wallet, but if you pull out the metro card... <laughs> You'll just stand in front of the turnstiles wondering what to do. <laughs> and if you come to like a Buddhist temple where everybody <laughs> takes off their shoes when they enter the temple, <laughs> When you're leaving, you won't even remember what shoes you left there. <laughs> you might walk away with a different pair of shoes. It's good you're selfless, right? <laughs> okay, I think we'll have to stop now for the lunch break, and then we can come back. Maybe do it in a little leisurely way, 12.15. And then we could have a question and answer session at 12.15 and discussion. Okay, so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. Until I saw Jin distributing the sharing of merits sheet, I almost forgot our routine of sharing the merits. <laughs> I've been living too much in the present. <laughs> Okay, so now we share the merits with the deities, the nagas or dragon spirits, the buddhas, the fear spirits, asking them to rejoice in the merits of this dharma gathering to protect the teaching and to protect the world. Other verses begin. Uh, right. <laughs> Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanumotiva Chirang Rakantu Sasanan Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanumotiva Chirang Rakantu Desanan Akasata Chabumata Eva Naga Mahidika Punyantang Anumodipa Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang Eta Vatacham Hei Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Devanumodantu Saba Sampati Siddhya Eta Vatacham Hei Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Bhutanumodantu Saba Sampati Siddhya Eta Vatacham Hei Sampadang punya sampadang sabe satanu modantu Sabha sampati siddhya Bhavagu padaya vichyeta to Etantare satakayu papanna Rupiya rupicha sanya sanyino Dukha pamuchantu pusantu nibhutin You know, one thing I thought just thought of that, well, while I was reciting the verses, <laughs> one thing I thought of with the drifting mind but that I should have mentioned, that you have to remember these verses are intended for a monk, or we say a monk or a nun, who's fully engaged in the practice of meditation. So don't think, you know, if you're living a household life, no more need for a shopping list, no more need to pay, pay the bills, no more need to plan for what's going to do tomorrow, the next day. 
Of course, like if a monk is living in the monastery, you know, he gets up, he does his meditation, when the wooden block is hit, then he knows it's time you go on alms round, come back, you take your meal, you take a little rest, then you go back to your meditation till maybe the block hits for the evening gathering, for the gathering for the evening bandana service, then you go back and do your meditation. So the life, you know, is very reduced to what most utter simplicity. But if you have work and household duties, then you have to do planning for the future based on memories of the past. But to the extent possible, we have to live, try to live in the present and at least devote some periods each day to dwelling completely in the present through one's meditation practice. Okay, so we'll have further discussion starting 12.15. Okay, so let us get up and do three half hours to the Buddha. Okay, half hour. Okay, so next week we'll do Sutta number 135 in the Majjhima Nikaya. And hopefully we could go back to the library, but if we have this many people next week, I don't know, maybe we should continue here. What do you think? Yeah, yeah maybe we continue here. We'll see how things go.